Greetings all. Welcome to another session here of uh, English Grammar. Today we're going to study the lexicon. Now, why would you ask if we're studying grammar, should we be looking at the lexicon? Well, the lexicon does have some relations with, uh, with uh, the grammar. And so we're going to try to investigate, no, we're not going into great detail, but we're going to investigate some of the relationships that, that are inherent within the lexicon that point to grammar, that have a relationship with grammar, because they're not as, as separate as we might once think. So we're going to look at the form of words, we're going to look at the meaning of some of the lexical items, and then we're going to look at the use of lexical items. Let's jump right in here to our little introduction here, talking about why in the world we're even looking at the lexicon when we're supposed to be studying grammar. Well, when you think about words, okay, words like driver or uh, um, driver or um, um, let's see here, investigation uh, or investigated, you know, we have T I O N at the end of investigation or E R at the end of driver. Those are grammatical markers to tell you, oh, this is a noun. This goes in the noun slot. Or E R would be, hey, this is a person. It's a noun that's a person. This kind of goes in the noun slot as well. Or or investigate, A-T-E. Well, that's a verb. That's a verb slot. It goes in the verb slot. So when we look at the words, we're saying, hey, it's not just a word that we're looking at, but we're looking at words that have some relation to where they belong in a sentence or how they belong in relation to other words in a, in a sentence. So there's really not this complete separation between the lexicon and the grammar. There's more of a, as Halliday would say, there's more of a continuum between the two. And so it's not two separate databases, but it's more of a, of a it's on, a, on the same type of plane. And there are connections that are weaved all throughout both the uh, grammar database and the lexicon database. So let's begin just by looking at some of these connections to see what they are. And when we think of words, uh, there are several different types of words. There are single words, there are compound words, and then there are phrases. Um, so for example, a single word would be something like single. Compound word would be something like um, uh, baseball, right? Or uh, um, split shift or uh, ice cream. Uh, you got a word that's a compound word. And then you've got phrases, and these are, are uh, vocabulary words that are multiple word uh, items that be, that it will constitute a single idea or a grammar or a uh, lexical word. Right. So we have a variety of words that we're going to be looking at, a variety of types of words that we'll be looking at, and you will look at when you begin to investigate. To be honest, I think you should include uh, even things that are, we don't even consider words in normal standard English, things like, uh, words like, uh-huh, or mm-mm, okay, mm-mm is a word in English, uh-huh is a word in English, uh, and it has some meaning and it does, you know, it does convey an idea. Those sounds do not convey the same idea in another language, in another culture, uh, but they do in, uh, in Native American uh, English, okay? I don't know about um, other countries like British English or Australian English or something like that. Um, in any event, we'll be dealing with a variety of different types of words. Now, when someone says, hey, what does it mean to know a word? Do you know this word? There are a lot of parts that you need to look at. You need to look at, for example, spelling and phonics and morphology. You can look at uh, syntactic features and derivations, collocations, semantics, uh, and pragmatics. There are a lot of different things that you can investigate when you're looking at something. Just for example, let's look at the word child. You've got the word child here, right? And uh, you need to know the morphology of child, which would be something like children if you're dealing with the plural. And I need to know that. The morphology of, of uh, plural child is not going to be childs. It's going to be children. I need to know that. I can look at some of the syntactic features, you know, for example, that it's countable, uh, that it's a noun, okay? I can look at some of the derivations of a word, like child. Uh, things like childlike or childish, I can know the derivations. I may know some of the collocations, again, words that go along with the word child, like child's play or childlike or childish. Um, uh, childish won't work because it's not a collocation. Uh, I can look at some of the semantic features of the word child. You know, for example, that it's human, that it's gender neutral. 
Uh, and I could look at some of the pragmatic features, uh, such as, for example, using the word child instead of using the word kid when I would use one and when I would use the other. So there are a number of features that goes into knowing a word. Right? We don't think about it when we're, when we're learning or when we're using language because a lot of this stuff is just... Um, in our subconscious, we don't think about it, okay? Unless we force it to uh, the front of our minds. Now, if you're learning a new language, a lot of these things you don't know at all. You don't know them subconsciously, and you don't know them consciously. Uh, in order to learn the language, though, you're going to have to understand what those are, okay? So let's take a look at the form of words. A morphological affixation we'll look at, some lexical features, and then we'll look at productive lexical processes. Let's begin by looking at some of the morphological uh, elements. English morphemes are basically broken down into two groups. You've got free morphemes and you've got bound morphemes. The free morphemes are ones that can stand alone all by themselves. They don't need to be connected to anything. So uh, window would be a unit, okay, and that's that would be a free morpheme. Anyway, you have some that are have lexical content. You have some that have grammatical function. Uh, you have some that are major parts of speech and some that are minor parts of speech. Your grammatical functions are obviously going to be minor parts of speech. But you also have bound morphemes, morphemes that must be connected to other morphemes in order to function properly. And there are lexical and grammatical uh, bound morphemes. Your lexical ones are derivational and your grammatical ones are inflectional. Okay? Derivational is going to let you know that you're going to change the part of speech uh, to some other part of speech, and you'll be able to add lots of those. Inflectional are more limited, and they're changing things like the time or the number or the quality uh, of a word. Inflectional uh, forms, inflectional little morphemes. For example, uh, in, wor in verbs, you've got ing for present participle. You've got uh, s for third person singular. You've got ed. Uh, for uh, past tense, and you have ed or en for past participle. Okay, and those are those four. The other remaining four, two are in nouns, where you have the possessives, and you have the plurals. Okay, and then in adjectives and adverbs, you have er and est. Those are your major inflectional forms. Okay, um, there are some oddball ones. We call them irregulars, right? Irregular inflections. So, for example, if you have things that have internal changes, like mouse and mice. Uh, by the way, what do you call two of these? That's one mouse. What do you call two of them? Do you call them two mice or do you call them two mouses? Okay. You tell me. You also have uh, inflectional forms that have absolutely no change. For example, deer and deer. Okay, and that's one in many. You have suppletive um, affix, a, uh, inflectional affixes. Things like go becomes went or good becomes better. Um, and those are, those are some of your irregular um, inflectional affixes. Okay, let's take a look now at some of the lexical features uh, that you find in these, uh, in these affixes um, and uh, some of the restrictions that, are, uh, that exist therein. For example, we have determiners. And as you know, determiners are things like an and the, or a there might be a possessive, or these, some of your relative pronouns could also be determiners, right? They're a way to mark a noun, basically, is what they are. And you have other types of uh, determiners that work with nouns but are somewhat restrictive. So, for example, we have the determiner much, the determiner little. Those work with only non-count non uh, nouns, right? Uh, they only work with things that you can't, I can't, I, I don't have much time. I, I can't say I don't have many time because many is a count noun, okay? Uh, little, I have uh, little opportunities. No, nope, I have to say I have few opportunities because opportunities I can count. Okay, so with these determiners, there are some limitations. There are some uncountable noun determiners. There are some countable noun determiners. There is uh, some noun determiners that only work in the plural, like various. Um, a also would not work with a, with a plural, right? Proper names. If there's a proper name, there is no determiner that should be used at all. Uh, again, we look at this nice little mouse and we say, oh, this is a mouse, right? I have the mouse. But the moment I begin to say, uh, call this mouse Steve, we're going to call this mouse Steve. And then all of a sudden, we don't use any determiners anymore. Pick up Steve and give me Steve. I don't say pick up the Steve, right? I say pick up the mouse, Right, but I don't say pick up Steve. No, it's a proper noun. Right now, it doesn't have any any um, uh, determiners. Uh, additionally, we have adjective phrases that have some um, restrictions. 
So for example, we have adjectives that are uh, transitive. They require some form of an object, okay? So for example, she is fond of you. The word fond is an adjective and it requires some transitive beyond it, right? Of you. I can't just say she is fond. Now, I, there are some optional types. I can say she is sweet, period. That's, a, that's an adjective. But I can also say she is sweet on you. Okay, I'm changing the meaning here, but it's still now a required thing. It can be optional. Then there are intransitive adjectives, adjectives that don't require uh, and don't need anything on the other side, right? She is tall. Tom is tall. Uh, I wouldn't say Tom is tall of you or Tom is tall oh, around you. <laughs> Tom is tall. That's all there is. <laughs> so we've got transitive and transitive adjectives. Go down to the verbs, and there are some verb noun restrictions, okay? Some, some verbs are intransitive. The boys rested, and that's all I have. I have period after this, right? I have transitives. The boys threw. They have to throw something. They have to throw a ball. They have to throw a, a, a rock. Uh, they have to throw a chicken. They have to throw up. <laughs> but they have to do something, right? There's some transit. It's a requirement on the other side. There are optional ones as well. Next one here. The boys smoke, I can say. The boys smoke, period. Or I can say the boys smoke cigarettes, okay? And there that object is not required, but it is optional, at least linguistically. Uh, semantically, it may be required because of, uh, to make it understood, right? There are also ditransitives, uh, a transitive that requires uh, more than one uh, object on the other side, right? The boys gave the girls a gift, right? Um, I owe you a favor, right? I owe a favor to you, right? If I were to even just say, I owe you, the favor is implied, right? I owe you something. Anyway, that's ditransitive. It requires two on the other side. And then there are co-occurrence restrictions with some prepositions. There are some verbs that require a specific preposition, right? Um, so, for example, if I use the word rely, uh, I'm going to rely on you. I'm going to rely on my wits. Uh, on is now required. It's a, it's a, if I'm going to use rely, I must have on uh, associated with it. It's a restrictive uh, co-occurrence. They have to work together with prepositions. Some lexical features. Let's take a look here at some uh, productive lexical processes. When we're dealing with compounds, and again, making that's two words that we're sticking together to make a new word. Um, we can do it in a variety of ways. We can do noun, noun, right? Uh, so, for example, um, a baby blanket. Um, baby bottle, okay? Uh, we can do noun verb, okay? Things like um, a dishwasher, um, okay? So that's, a, that's a, a new word. We can use uh, adjective noun. That would be something like um, um, uh, a, wool, a wool jacket, okay? Uh, a red letter. Okay, uh, maybe a, a preposition and a, a noun might be um, um, an overcoat. Okay, that would be an, uh, that would be one an overcoat. Uh, a preposition and a verb would be maybe something like overvalue or uh, past due, uh, overdue. Uh, so that's ways that we make uh, we make compounds by combining in this way. Uh, those are the different ways that we can do that. Uh, some other uh, lexical processes for for uh, your students is uh, derivational affixes. The most common ones I would recommend that you teach your students. Teach your students what un means, what anti means, what non, by, inter, what all these mean, because then they can try to use them in other places. They know what these are, that these affixes mean a certain thing. You can teach them teach them to the students, and then they're going to be able to have a better control as far as what's going on. They're going to try to take now a verb and try to make it a noun. They're going to take a, a verb and make it uh, uh, a negative. So I, I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you, depending on uh, on the students that you have, whether they're going into academics or not, depending if they're going, how high they're going as far as language mastery, teach the parts of speech. Noun, verb, adjective, adverb, so that they can talk about language. Uh, bear in mind, the majority of your conversation is not about language. But there are times where you want to direct them to it so you can explain a linguistic element and then go back to the whatever content you're dealing with. So you, I would recommend that you teach parts of speech. 
Um, also, we can talk about conversion from one part of speech to another. And if your students can know, can learn how to do this, how to convert from a noun to a verb or a verb to a noun, they're going to get uh, better control over their language. So, so, for example, we have the noun pepper, and I make it a verb, right? It was peppered with, right? We change it to a verb. Or we've got just this, this role here. We've got from drive to driver. Okay, we go from govern to government to, to governmental, and each time we add a different uh, affix, a different suffix onto the end. If your students can learn how to do that, they'll be able to take the word educate and make it education. They'll be able to take the word transportation and put it back to its original transport, because they're going to be able to see all the connections with these uh, suffixes and prefixes. Um, so it's a good thing if they learn how to do these conversions. Other things that are going to be difficult for some of your students that you might want to encourage them to learn are things like uh, homonymy and po polysemy. <laughs> Try to say that fast three times. Uh, homophones, um, if anybody knows um, uh, veggie tales, you all know what a homophone is. <laughs> um, but there are words out there that are sound like other words. So they sound the same way, like they're there and there, right? Or they're written the same way. The wind blows and wind the clock, but they're both written the same way, W-I-N-D. And we have a number of those uh, in the English language. In uh, polysemy, we have some words that sound the same, that are spelled the same, but they don't mean the same. So, for example, we have he lives in a particular city, and he lives, he's not dead, okay? He resides and he exists, two different meanings. This is going to be difficult for some of your students. Okay, where you've got the same word, the same spelling, the same sound, but in the different context, it has a different meaning. Okay, it's a completely different meaning. These are some, you know, productive problems or productive elements that you may want your students to be aware of, especially because some of these are going to be difficult for your students. All right, we've looked at... Uh, uh, the first section there as far as the elements here. Now let's look at some of the lexical terms that we have here. And we have a variety of them. Uh, semantic features, meaning extension, denotation, connotation, cultural association, uh, lexical aspects, uh, the arg uh, argument of uh, structure of the verbs, semantic fields, and then prototypicality. So let's move on into these. Let's take a look at semantic features. Now, when they talk about semantic features, when we talk about semantic features, we're talking about some related items, some sub-categories, uh, some sub-explanations, uh, definitions, components of a word that are always, always a part of a word. You know, you take the word, the word uh, child again, as we saw earlier, and we can look at it as child abstract or is it concrete? Well, child is uh, concrete. Is it living or non-living? Well, it's living. Is it plant or animal? Well, it's an animal. Okay? All of these fit under this one word, child, that it's a noun. Yes, it's concrete, living, animal, human, uh, neuter. Okay? So we can look at a lot of different things and see semantic features below them, inside them, connected to them. Uh, and then we find some words that are related to those. We'll look at collocations a little bit later. But words by themselves have all of this extra information stored within them. Okay? And so we're not just looking at one word. Some of these features will have relation to uh, the grammar of a sentence. Okay? That's why this is important to understand as we move forward. Uh, if you look at some of the semantic features, we have, for example, the tower fell. Well, towers can fall. But the tower cried, it's not something a tower can do because cry has within it something living. Okay, a tower is not living, therefore a tower cannot cry. The dog dreamed, and yes, believe it or not, dogs dream. Dogs dream because dogs are living and they have uh, a brain, right? Uh, the rock dreamed, rocks don't dream. That's not something I can say because rocks don't have the capacity to dream, okay? Again, these are just restrictions because of what is inherently understood within a particular word. The heat spoiled the tomatoes. Okay, the heat can spoil tomatoes. The heat spoiled the desert. I don't think that's possible. Right? 
uh, because heat can't spoil something that isn't living. Okay, same type of thing. The mare was pregnant. Well, the word pregnant has within it a bunch of ideas. One being that you have to be living and you have to be female. So the mare, okay, that works. But the stallion, that's not going to work because stallions can't be pregnant. Okay, so semantic features underlie every word that we use, uh, particularly the uh, the content words, although non-content words as well. And so when you're looking at a word, it provides restrictions as to where it can be used, how it can be used, because these semantic features exist. I'm hoping this makes sense. Now, where it breaks down is when you extend the meaning. So, for example, when you personify something. The wind blew. That's fine. Wind blows, right? The wind is howling. Well, winds don't howl. What howls? Animals howl, right? Dogs, wolves in particular, okay? But when we say it's howling, it's because it's making a sound that sounds like, and we make that whole thing, right? The wind is biting. Well, the wind doesn't bite, but because of the way it hits you, right, you personify it. Now, in this sense, I can do this. In a literal sense, I can't, right? Metaphors. I can say, you stole my money. Okay, I can't say you stole my heart. If I did, it might hurt a whole bunch, right, if you pull out my heart. But this is a metaphor, right? Some some guy or some girl has stolen your heart, right? You've fallen in love with them type of thing. Those types of things are legal, but they break, their, they break the semantic restrictions that are normally there when you're dealing with uh, concrete elements, right? Other ways that we can look at vocabulary that's going to impact things are, the, are uh, denotation, connotation, and then cultural association. Okay, the denotation is the dictionary definition. Okay, um, it's a it's just the word and what it means in a dictionary. Right, the connotation are the feelings or the implications or the things that aren't said about a particular word. Best example that I remember was when uh, I was uh, at a party with a whole bunch of uh, Japanese students, and there was this one gentleman, a uh, nice gentleman, talking with this elderly lady. And when he was finished talking with her, he said, "You know, I, I really loved this little uh, this intercourse, and I would love to have some more with you." Of course, the woman turned three shades of white. The dictionary definition of intercourse not only does it as sexual, but it also means a crossing. Uh, an, an intersection between, you know, two peoples or two, two uh, uh, even two locations, two ideas. And he was using the dictionary definition. No problem. They were having an interchange, an, an, an exchange, a crossing, a combining. No problem at all. What he didn't realize was the connotation. And so he needed to know that. <laughs> caused a problem. Now, fortunately, the woman he was talking with was very kind and polite and explained to him that uh, the meaning, although he was correct, was not used that way because of the connotation, right? Um, and then we have things like uh, culture, uh, the specific meaning of a certain word, right? Um, so if I were to call you a chicken, oh, you're just a chicken. Some people in other cultures won't under... I mean, the dictionary definition of a chicken, and we know what that is. The connotation that goes along with chicken, I maybe have some... But if I call you a chicken, right, that's cultural to this language. In another culture, they might call you something else. They may call you a... You know, a, if I call you a crybaby in this language, in other cultures, they call you a, a, a cry bug. A cry bug in our culture? Wouldn't make any sense. Right? Um, <laughs> I remember... <laughs> Again, I was overseas, and this gentleman was on the radio being interviewed, and someone asked him, "Well, how do you how do you like uh, you know the food in in uh, in Tokyo?" And this guy said, "Oh, I'm crazy about the food." And then the announcer apologized. We're so sorry that he said that. Uh, please excuse him. You know, he doesn't realize. Well, crazy in uh, in some Japanese circles is a very bad thing. It doesn't mean that you're you really really like it. It means you have a mental problem. <laughs> So there was a cultural element there that this particular uh, foreigner did not realize, okay? Connotation, denotation, uh, cultural expectation. Um, additionally, we have some lexical aspects, okay? So we have semantic verb classes. There are a lot of different types of verb classes, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but again, these are some semantic features. Some verbs are related to time. Uh, some verbs are things that happen once and then they're done. And there are other types of verbs um, 
uh, that have you know all different kinds. I'm not going to go into all of them now, but you should realize that they have all of these different characteristics, right? Um, and they can be altered with different inflections. So, for example, Sally is working. Work has to do with a, dis a duration of time. It's it's you know something that happens for a long period of time. But then we add for the summer. Now it's temporary. Okay, so we've kind of changed the implication of the of the um, of the verb there, just to let you know that these semantic elements can change the the ideas or this or the underlying components uh, of verbs. Okay, and uh, now let's look at another one here: the arguments or the participants uh, associated with a verb. Right? Uh, Tanya drinks. Tanya, uh, Linda made the. The copies, copies, right? Janice sends me a letter. Okay, so when you look at these here, for example, you've got one component, and then two components, and then three components. And there are some uh, variables that go with a verb that are required. Okay, so with the first one, there's only one argument that's required. The second one, there are two. Uh, requiring the third one, there are three. Okay, some verbs uh, require these extra features. Some verbs don't. Okay. Uh, so, for example, Pete touched the window. I can say that. That's okay. I can say Pete struck the window. Yep, that works okay, too. I can say Pete broke the window. All three of those are, are, are okay. They're, they're legal. But when I try to turn things around, I'm going to have a problem. The window touched. I can't make it passive, right? The window. I can't say the window touched. The window doesn't have that capability. The window struck. Okay, well, the window doesn't have the ability to reach out and strike. The window broke. The window has the capability to do that, interestingly enough. Pete touched the dog. I can say that. Okay, Pete touched the window. Pete touched the dog. Those are both legal. Pete struck the dog. I can say that as well, right? I can say Pete struck the dog. I can't say Pete broke the dog. I can break a window. The window can break, but Pete can't break a dog. Okay. There are simply, just to show you, there are restrictions, not only with the participants, but there are restrictions within these verbs, some things that are it allows to do and something that it doesn't allow to do. Okay, Restrictions within these. Um, let's go on. Uh, I want to talk about semantic fields. Um, semantic fields uh, is a, an idea where you have a cluster of words that have similar meanings. Uh, and this is an excellent way for you to teach uh, vocabulary to students where you have a key word and a variety of subwords that are associated with it. Uh, like, for example, what we were just looking at, hit and strike, uh, smack. You know, they have similar meanings and they would all be semantically related uh, because they have similar meanings. Okay, and you can teach words that way. And for some students, that's going to be a plus. Other students, they're going to want to know them simply because then they don't need to use their native language to get a definition. This is what I used to do. I would learn a new word when I was studying, for example, Japanese, and then I wanted to find another word that meant similar, something similar. And that way I could memorize this word based on another word instead of jumping back into English to try to learn that word. Okay? Benefit of semantics. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about uh, prototypicality. There are prototypical nouns and there are peripheral nouns. Okay? Just think, for example, if you have a picture of a table in your mind. Okay. My guess is, if I say, to picture a table in your mind, my guess is that you're going to have a table that's probably square or rectangle. And you're going to have a table that's got four legs. Okay. Now, if uh, you had a picture of a table that wasn't that, I would say that's not prototypical. That's the prototypical table. Now, if your table has only one leg and it's connected to the wall, right, well, that, yeah, that's a table, but that's not the kind of table I would think that is normal. It's not a prototypical table. We have nouns that are the same way. You're normal nouns, and then you've got peripheral nouns, nouns that really don't look like nouns. You know, they don't dress like nouns. Uh, like, for example, a gerund, swimming, right? Swimming, you think the ing, you think it's a verb, you think it's an action, and all of a sudden says, swimming is fun. Swimming is now a noun, right? Well, it doesn't look like a noun doesn't sound like a noun, but it's in a noun slot. Right? The image in my head is of an action, right? It's not normal. That's a peripheral noun. Okay? We've got prototypical nouns, nouns that look like nouns, that fit in the noun slot, okay? and then you've got uh, your peripherals, ones that are not quite so normal. Okay? 
Lastly, let's look at the use of lexical items. Okay, when we're using these items, where are we using them? How are we using them? First thing we'll look at is collocation. There are certain words that go together with other words. And it's interesting, the, the computer-assisted uh, corpus linguistics, when they start analyzing words using a computer, they get a huge blocks of text, and they analyze them. And they recognize that, for example, like we said earlier, rely, whenever you have rely, you've got on. And they've got reams now of information to show that words occur next to other words. And uh, it's, it's not a made-up pattern, okay? Certain word types co-occur with other words, right? A long walk, okay? You're going to see that often. S statistically significant. Boy, whenever you see statistically, you're probably going to see significant or, or not statistically. They're going to go together, okay? It's just the way words work. You take a walk whenever you take something. That's one of the things you're probably going to take. Take, and then there are a limited number of things that you take. Take your time. Take a walk, right? Uh, ask, okay? Oftentimes, what do you ask? You ask a question. These are going to go together. They're just going to fit together. Words don't occur randomly. You'd think that makes sense, right? Hello, evolution. Words don't occur randomly. They occur in co-located systems. That's co-locations. There's a ton of that. You could do a whole course on that. Just co-locations. How they work, uh, what the most important ones are, how to use it to teach language. And that's a whole world out there. Just co-locations. Okay? Lexical phrases. Okay, These are the specific uh, uh, co-located phrases that serve specific functions. Okay, These are specific groups of words that serve a specific function. Right? And oftentimes we tell students, learn some of these because that will help you uh, continue a conversation or control a conversation uh, or ask for information. Because it's a, it's a set phrase that we use. For example, for example, it might be one, right? By the way, for your information, can I help you? Uh, and oftentimes when students are learning uh, only a certain a limited amount of vocabulary, they're going to learn these lexical phrases because they're going to be able to use them. La, this past year I was in China and I went to a very nice hotel and everyone at the hotel spoke English. Now one thing I do know is they didn't speak a lot of English, but they knew all the lexical phrases uh, in order to do well at the hotel. You know, things like, may I help you? You know, do you need a room key? And things like that. Put those together. There were stock phrases for these kids. It was very interesting. All right. Lastly, discourse communities. Uh, discourse communities has to do with, uh, this, this block is wrong. Uh, shame on me. Uh, discourse communities has to do with the fact that we live in communities where we speak in a certain style. And so students who are learning um, how to speak, how to write should learn whatever that community is. If, for example, you're going to work in the academy, you're going to get a job at a school, you should learn, you know, colleges. Uh, if you're going to work in a business, uh, if you're going to work in import-export, well, then you should learn business ease. So, and by ease, I mean the language of the business. Learn the language of the community that you're going to be dis, uh, speaking in. Right? If you're going to be dealing with uh, kids on the street, well, then you're going to learn a different discourse. Okay, um, And so there's going to be these different discourse communities, and your students and you should recognize which communities are my students going to need okay, and teach those communities so that they can recognize them and that when the situation arises, your students, and, yeah, your students can switch and enter into that register. And that's all that I have for this particular uh, chapter. Uh, some things that you need to remember that uh, for non-native speakers and for anyone, uh, the lexicon is not merely a list of words. It's a network of words associated with a network of other words and a network of underlying uh, restrictions and conditions and meanings. It's a very large element, and I would love to have an entire class just on the lexicon. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to do that, but if you do have any more questions about this as we move on, as we study grammar, please let me know. If not, have a